so you look wonderful oh All thank you so do you all right starting now okay well they'll start everybody's gonna start joining here in a second so so do you are you gonna queue us up or do you just um you uh you should be able to go and get started right now okay okay um Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Iltifat Humzavi and I'm a member of the HS Foundation Board. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce your speaker today because we're gonna open up HS Awareness Week. This is the first lecture from HS Awareness Week and the foundation is so happy to have you. And today we have a special treat. Our president, Dr. Jocelyn Kirby, will be speaking today. She's an associate professor of dermatology at Penn State Hershey. She's also the president of the HS Foundation and she earned her medical degree from the University of Virginia, as well as completing a residency at one of the most elite institutions in our specialty at the University of Pennsylvania. She also has a master's of public health in public health sciences, as well as medical education. And her focus of her clinical research, as well as outcomes work, is on hydroadenitis separativa. I have worked with her for so many years, and the first thing that she gives credit to is the support of her husband and her two wonderful daughters. Um, but she's also passionately committed to our field. She is passionately committed to the patients that we care for, as well as the families that support our patients. And I can think of no better person to start off HS Awareness Week than her. Enjoy the lecture. You're going to learn a lot about biologics for HS. I also know that she'll tell you all the wonderful things that are going on with our foundation um, over the next couple of weeks during HS Awareness Week. So welcome, Dr. Jocelyn Kirby. Thanks so much, Ilt. So Ilt did not introduce himself, but he was our most recent uh, president for the HS Foundation. So uh, I am truly honored by that introduction, Ilt. So thank you. Um, and yes, it's HS Awareness Week. So happy Monday. Um, I'm going to say it's the best Monday of the year right now because it's a, a real honor to be able to research uh, this condition and to feel like every day when I sit down at the computer or sit down with people who have this condition, um, that it's an opportunity to make a real difference. Um, now we're, we're really diving right in. Uh, we're talking about biologics for HS uh, and I'm skipping over a little bit of, um, you know, I can say the typical talk for HS, which is HS happens in about one out of a hundred people. It's not as rare as we thought it was. One out of 100 is as common as rheumatoid arthritis. It's as common as vitiligo. It's about half as common as psoriasis. And I see a psoriasis commercial like every time I sit down to watch a show on TV. So HS is really, I think, stomping into um, public knowledge and for, uh, I think, a really important reason. Um, it's incredibly impactful. Uh, so we need to help people recognize when they have this condition um, and to also, I think, let everyone know that a lot of research is happening. That's why biologics, this talk, is even possible because we have so much more of an understanding about what HS is. Uh, so one of a hundred people and it's a immune condition. So a lot like eczema and psoriasis, again, more common skin conditions that we, I think, talk about and see a lot more in the media and hear from um, just anybody we might talk to. Um, but HS is right there next to those conditions as a condition that is caused by an overactive immune system. Um, so I'll try and throw a, through a few pearls in here, uh, here and there about how to frame this information as we're talking to people who have HS, because very often this journey has taken them anywhere from three years to 12 years to get a diagnosis be told what is happening to them and that it has a name, it's called HS, but also be given good information, uh, which is your immune system is overactive. Many people have sometimes concluded or been told that their immune system is defective, deficient, low. And if that's their understanding, then using a medication like a biologic that's working on the immune system can be pretty scary. So I think sitting down and asking people uh, some questions is a good way to start. So we're gonna ask some questions uh, about these treatments. And the first one is who, who do we treat with something like a biologic? 
Uh, so I put this picture here because a few years ago, uh, I work at a university and we have grand rounds. And so that means that we teach other dermatologists and other physicians, training physicians, training students um, about skin conditions. And so we had somebody with HS come in to help teach our providers. And I felt like our presentation wasn't really snapping. It wasn't really gonna get people's attention. So I asked one of our training doctors to go back into the room and ask this person with HS one question. And that question was, how does your HS impact you? And the answer she gave us, because she was about a 30 year old woman, she said, I can't be the mother that I wanna be because of my HS. I have it under my arms, I have it on my chest. And every time my baby wiggles, it causes a lot of pain and I worry that I'm gonna drop her. And so hearing that is very different than us just looking at the skin and evaluating, well, let me count up how many bumps you have. And if that equals the right number, then I put you on a biologic or I don't. If she had come in with a smaller number of bumps than maybe what we would consider to be moderate or severe, we might not have given her the medication when this condition, HS, was really impacting her ability to live her life. And so when we are evaluating which person is maybe a good candidate, it's not just looking at the skin and evaluating what early stage is this patient? How many abscesses and nodules does this person have? It's also asking the questions, which is how does your HS impact you and is it controlled? And so the other two questions on this slide kind of get at that point of control. And some people come in on a good day. You're not gonna see a lot of lesions on their skin. How do you evaluate that presence of control? And so I'll often ask people, how often do you get a flare up? And a lot of people with HS can really speak to how often am I getting a number of lesions that I experience as a flare? For a lot of patients, uh, this is some research by one of our other board members, Dr. Amit Garg, about 70% of people will have a flare up at least once a month. That's once a month or more often. How often does one of these flare ups usually last? Well, that can vary by patient, but most people will experience a flare anywhere from seven to 10 days. So I've learned to do that math kind of out loud with the person. And so I'll say, okay, so you, you had a flare up about once a month and it lasts for about 10 days of every 30 days. So that's about a third of every month. That's a third of your year. Um, you know, is that, is that control for you? Uh, and so I think when people are contemplating, is it worth it to me to make a change in treatment or start a treatment, kind of reflecting on those questions has really, I think, helped me and helped patients make that decision. Now, in clinical trials, what we'll often see is that the, the decision of, is this somebody who is a candidate for a biologic is dependent on what Hurley stage they are. So this is Hurley stage two, which is where most clinical trials and studies uh, start enrolling. Uh, this is someone who might have one tunnel. Uh, so this kind of area of folded elevated skin right here is a tunnel. Uh, this is somebody with Hurley stage three where there are now multiple tunnels and they're connected uh, and coalescing over that body site. This is somebody with Hurley stage one who has a couple of inflammatory nodules uh, under their arm, but no presence of tunnels. Um, now, I think that the challenge with Hurley staging, it's not perfect because it ties the presence of tunnels to the presence of scarring, meaning it says there's the presence of a tunnel and there's a presence of a scar. Whereas Hurley stage one says there's no tunnels and there's no scars, but this person, and we'll sometimes joke, somebody didn't read the textbook and that's pretty typical. And really it should be put on us as we didn't describe appropriately what's happening in real life. And so there are people who don't have tunneling but do have this very, I would say impactful scarring. Uh, even when we get rid of this inflammation, this young woman is still impacted by the presence of this scar. It's going to change what clothing she might wear, if she feels comfortable going to the beach, what bathing suit she might choose, how she feels when she goes on a date, and how she might interact with somebody when she's intimate. So even though these are in hidden areas of the skin, they are still incredibly impactful areas of the skin. So going back to which person is a candidate for these newer medications, the biologics, it's asking the questions of the person as well as looking at their skin. And so I'll consider the presence of tunneling, 
or the presence of scarring, even if there's no tunneling, is maybe as a reason to maybe start a biologic or at least talk about it with someone. So what biologics do we have available? Again, biologics are medications that are impacting the immune system. The one that has the most evidence is gonna be adalimumab. So this is level 1A, uh, another TNF inhibitor. So working on the uh, tumor necrosis factor as a target is infliximab, which has a slightly lower level of evidence as B or level two. This is still good uh, research that's um, come from people uh, rather than say studies of chemicals in the lab only. Um, but as we go down, we have less and less evidence for medications um, based on uh, fewer and fewer randomized controlled trials. Right now we only have the phase three randomized controlled trials for adalimumab. So adalimumab is our one FDA approved medication. Um, now that's important and bolded because that means that it's a little bit less difficult to get that medication for our patients. Um, everything that doesn't have FDA approval just means that insurance companies have an easier time saying no to us because they'll say that's off label or it might be experimental, even though we actually have research showing that it can be effective. So adalimumab is FDA approved for people down to the age of 12 and older. Um, so you might be uh, surprised to know that HS actually starts in many uh, people around the age of eight or nine or 10. So having a medication that's FDA approved down to this age is really important. Dosing of this, uh, you load. So it's 160 milligrams on the first day, two weeks later, 80 milligrams. You can continue that 80 milligrams every other week. And for some people with HS, they're not all that excited about using an injectable medication. Uh, and so this is in the face of also some of my patients saying, when I get a flare and it's really tight and painful, I have to you know, poke it with a needle to get that fluid to release. And so don't be surprised that somebody with HS will go to great lengths to give themselves relief and to pop one of those abscesses but at the same time, not be all that excited about using a needle-based medication. Um, so I think just helping them know that you can use this medicine twice a month or for some people, 40 milligrams weekly. This was the original dosing. You can use either one, they're both FDA approved. The graphic at the bottom here is the data that we have to support the use of adalimumab. And so when I'm looking at a study, uh, one of the first questions I ask myself is, what is this medicine doing above and beyond the natural course of the condition? And so there's always a placebo effect in every study and for every condition, whether it's acne or hair loss or hydranitis. And so what we can see here is about 26 to 28% of people when they were in these studies just naturally, and I go like this because I think of HS as a roller coaster, they just naturally had a decrease in how much inflammation they had. Again, we're interested in what does this medication do beyond that natural a number of people who have improvement and about 42 to 59 percent of people will have a meaningful reduction in their disease and that is significant meaning that is mathematically a higher percentage of people than just by chance would have a decrease or an improvement in how much hs they have so that speaks to what's the power of this medicine it is effective beyond just chance um, and it's about twice as likely Occasionally that uh, regular dosing of 40 milligrams every week or 80 every other week isn't quite enough. And so some of our colleagues in Europe uh, have published this study looking at a small number of people, about a dozen, actually 14, where they were able to use adalimumab at double the dose, so 80 milligrams weekly. And they kind of charted how many abscesses, nodules, and tunnels they had, and the name for that um, uh, score for their activity is called the IHS-4. So the, as the score goes down, that's fewer lesions on the skin. And so I put a box around the period of time that would be about six months, because it's really hard to leave somebody on a medicine and say, it's going to kick in any second, any second. You know, it's a really impactful disease. So uh, this person, they waited a, a pretty long period of time, you know, almost eight or nine months to see if their disease would finally improve, um, but kind of saw that ultimately it didn't. But there were a really high number of people you can see whose scores really decreased if they could get the 80 milligrams weekly. Um, I often have to really fight with insurance companies in order to get this covered. Uh, so it's a pretty uncommon approach uh, compared to the 80 milligrams every other week. 
So that question of when do we figure out somebody's actually responding to this medicine? Um, so this is based on some science. And I think it's an important question because a lot of times when people are committing to starting a medicine, they've committed to taking one of these injectable medicines, even though they might not be excited about using a needle-based medicine, maybe they're a little bit leery of using a medicine that might modulate their immune system, even though we've talked about how HS actually is an overactivity of the immune system. Um, I think helping people understand Let's set expectations. This medicine should show us what it's capable of doing at about six months. Um, and I'll, I'll walk through this data in just a second. So just because you start a medication does not mean you have to stay on it forever, especially if it's not giving you the improvement that you want. So this data is from those um, initial pioneer trials. These are people who went into those two big phase three studies and they were evaluated at week 12. And some people actually didn't get that meaningful improvement in their disease. So we're looking at just those people who didn't have success in the first 12 weeks of the trial. They went on to continue to look to see, well, if after three months, how many people actually have the drug kick in and have success? And so looking at the line here of boxes, these are people who are on the appropriate dose that we use now because in these old trials, we weren't quite sure yet if people could go on to a lower dose of medication. The answer is no, um, they probably need 40 milligrams every week or 80 every other week. But the answer in this data here, when we look at these boxes, is that about 20% of people, not a huge amount, about 20% of people that didn't succeed at week, or sorry, month three, will succeed at month six, which is uh, 24 weeks. This is the second mirror image trial. Um, people here, same drug, still had HS, but we always do two of these phase three trials when we're trying to get FDA approval. People again had not gotten success by week 12 and about 30-ish, if we're optimistic, maybe 40%, but I'm often not super optimistic about this number, maybe 30% of people uh, achieved success if they hadn't at week 12 by week six. You can see here, maybe some people go on to have success after nine um, months or so, but that's a really long time to wait. And it's not like 100% of people. So it was about 40% of people that didn't have success. So that's why I tend to wait at about six months um, at the longest to evaluate when is somebody responding to a medication. The other thing that I've, learned from trial and error is that right now we don't have a medicine yet that can dissolve some of these really stubborn lesions. Medications can help decrease some of the lesions that might pop up and move around on the body. It's sort of like the whack-a-mole. Um, we don't want to chase around lesions doing surgery on them. Uh, we want to try and quiet those down with medications if we can. And so when I often go into a room, whether it's somebody who just recently started a biologic or started a different medication uh, for their HS, I bring them back at about three, four, at the longest six months to see how they're doing. And I ask the question of, well, what are you noticing? And if they say, you know, I'm noticing that I'm still getting a lot of spots that kind of move around. Well, that means that, again, we're not going to chase these with surgery. Let's mix up our medications. We either need to double the dose of that adalimumab, or we need to change to a different drug because this one is not controlling you. But sometimes we walk into the room and somebody says, you know, I still have HS and that's really frustrating. And when we ask, well, how is it behaving? Is it lesions that pop up and move around or are they more kind of stuck in the same place over and over? And this patient says, you know what? I noticed that it's kind of the same spots that continue to puff up and go down, they get painful and go down and it's always in the same place. Well, this is one of those persistent areas that probably is a tunnel and you can kind of see how it's a little bit elongated here. We've quieted down all those migratory lesions, the ones that are moving around. But again, we don't really expect medicines to be able to dissolve some of these really stubborn tunnels. And so this is partial success. And this is the exact reason why we as dermatologists are the perfect people to treat this condition because we know the medicines and we can do the procedures. And if it's too big a procedure, we've got our colleagues, the plastic surgeons to help us. But we can really get this person great control over their disease by using the medicine to quiet down all the things that were popping up here and there and just going back 
doing an office-based procedure to get rid of this one stubborn one. And those procedures can be, again, not removing the entire axilla. That's not necessary for this patient. We can remove some of the isolated tunneling through what's called the de-roofing or excising around it. So let's say it's a patient who really isn't having success with that medication and it's more of those migratory lesions. So we need to change up medicines. Again, we're waiting about four to six months to assess is this the right medicine for this person or not? And if it's not, then again, we're starting the new biologic and I start it either when the old medicine would be due. So uh, for example, if it's Humira or Adalimumab and we're dosing it every week, as soon as the person gets that new medication, either in the mail or the appointment, if it's an infused medication, we're gonna do it the next week if that was the schedule. But some people are on medications that might be given every 12 weeks, like ustekinumab. Um, you know what, if they're not under control, I'm not gonna wait 12 weeks to say, well, you've gotta wait till that medicine is kind of out of your system a little bit more because there's a lot of research from inflammatory bowel disease, which has a inflammation that's really similar to hydradenitis superativa. And they've shown in people who are on very similar medications that when you have overlapping medicines, the risk of infection, of dangerous things happening is really, really low. So there's a lot of things in medicine that we worry about without actually having data to show us that we should worry about it. So we anticipate it when it's not really there. So I really like that the folks in um, GI uh, studied this with an inflammatory bowel disease. So when somebody's uh, not under control, I'm gonna start that new medication as soon as we have it in hand. So the other medication that I often turn to if somebody hasn't responded to adalimumab is infliximab. And part of this is because I work at a university and at a university, I don't get samples. So that means that it's really hard for me to use some of these other medications like ustekinumab or glimumab or a handful of other things. But I find that infliximab is one of the medicines that I usually can get relatively easy covered by insurance. And I'll talk about uh, how to get drugs for your patients when they're off label in a second. Uh, but the nice thing about infliximab is that it can also be adjusted. It's much more flexible than some of these other medications. We can adjust the dose based on people's weight. We can also adjust how frequently we give the medication, which is also a really nice way to either increase the amount of medicine that somebody's on by changing the dose or changing how often they get it. And this is some more nice research from one of the folks on our board, Dr. Chris Syed. And so he looked at lots of patients who were on infliximab and he looked at what dose did we start them on? And sometimes this is dependent on the decision they make that day. Sometimes it's dependent on what insurance will cover. So that's why there's a little bit of variability. So the amount of medicine varied from five milligrams per kilogram of weight given every eight weeks, and this is the psoriasis dose, and you can see very few people got this dose, and it's probably because of their experience, that this just isn't effective. Um, people with HS have more inflammation than people with psoriasis. They need more medicine, and they need it, need it more often. And so you can see that they were already going above that to about 7.5 milligrams per kilogram of weight every eight weeks, and even up to 10 milligrams per kilogram of weight every eight weeks at the start. And then they did this nice graph showing where did they end up later on. Now, there were about 10 people who discontinued, and we don't know all the reasons for that. It may have been that it just didn't work for them, or they didn't tolerate it, or a lot of other reasons. Um, but eventually, about two-thirds of people did end up being on a stable dose, which might be because they were pretty happy with it. And to that point, about two-thirds of people achieved this meaningful improvement in their on HS. So this is that same measure of success as was used in the, the Humira or adalimumab studies. Now, when people got to this point, about two thirds uh, reaching success, they kind of described what dose were people on. And so you can kind of see here on the right hand side, pretty much everyone ended up on more medicine than when they started. 10 milligrams per kilogram of weight every eight weeks was actually one of the lowest dosing regimens that they used but there were a lot more people who went up to doses of 10 milligrams per kilogram of weight every six weeks and every five or four weeks, so more frequently. Higher amounts of medicine, more often, 
are things that people with HS need. So uh, when I usually ask insurance to cover this medication, I'm asking for 10 milligrams per kilogram every six weeks. And then we can always go back and ask for every four. And if I have to settle for 10 milligrams per kilogram every eight weeks, that's okay. I can always go back to insurance and ask for every six or every four. It's a pretty rare day that I get success asking for 10 milligrams per kilogram every four weeks. But you know what? It's The downside is time. If you ask for this and it's not covered, it takes time to go back and ask for the other versions. So I'm trying to decrease the inefficiency of the process by asking for a dose and a dosing frequency um, that I'm more likely to have success with or get insurance uh, to cover. So I put in this slide because in dermatology, we don't usually use methotrexate very often. It's an older medication. It requires some lab tests, but it still does have some value. And that's because adalimumab and infliximab, the two drugs that I spent the most time talking about, these medicines, for some reason, trigger our immune systems to start to recognize them as not part of us. Um, so they're bigger proteins. That's one of the reasons why you can't just take a pill of adalimumab or take a pill of infliximab. It would be like the most expensive protein pill you ever took. Your body would just digest it. Sort of like why you can't take a pill of insulin. Your body would just digest it. It wouldn't act like insulin. Your body would break it apart like it would egg whites or drinking milk. Um, it has to be injected in order for the protein to stay in the right shape and get to the right place. Um, so because we have to inject it, the body sometimes starts to recognize it. And so adding methotrexate is an option if we're trying to rescue the effect of the medicine. So when somebody's maybe stopped responding to the medicine, they were doing pretty well, but then they stopped. Uh, what you can sometimes consider is, do I need to double the dose? Do I need to add methotrexate? Do I need to move on? So let me walk through this table for a second. So when we've got somebody, when you send off an adalimumab or infliximab level, and, uh, so these are the values. If they're very high, they're above the target range, whether an antibody is present or not, it's not the right drug. So this is somebody who's still got a lot of HS. You've got lots of drug in their body. It's just not the right drug for them. But if there are people who the drug level is low, it might be because they have an antibody that is blocking that drug from working. And so if somebody has low amounts of the medicine and there is an antibody present, then this is an opportunity to consider adding the methotrexate to rescue the effect of that drug. It blocks the antibody, so it takes the brakes off. Um, but at the same time, not everybody's super excited about taking a second medicine in order to have the first one work. And so yes, you can change. But if somebody has low amounts of the drug, it's below target, but there's no antibody there, this says this person needs more medicine. It's it's in their system, but not enough. And it's, it's not being blocked by something. So let's put more medicine into this person. And so the opportunity is to maybe double the dose of the adalimumab. And sometimes I'll use these drug levels to help make that argument to insurance. Some of the other medicines that are available on the market right now, but not FDA approved for hydradenitis are Anakinra, so this blocks interleukin-1, a uh, very pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, in the skin and in the body. Uh, Ustekinumab, this is uh, FDA approved for both inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis. Etanercept, this is an older medicine that's in the same family as uh, adalimumab and infliximab, um, but it's not nearly as strong, so it really doesn't uh, get used very often. And galimumab, um, not uh, very frequently used for HS. It's a little bit harder to get covered. So um, we've got you know, all these different uh, targets. So drug classes, TNF inhibitors, things that target interleukin-17. I mentioned interleukin-1. Um, how do we make these choices? What, what do we use if we don't have a ton of data for HS? Well, sometimes it's based on the person's comorbidities. Um, so I have had a number of young people with HS maybe have a history of cervical cancer uh, or a lymphoma. And so taking a 
cancer uh, history when we're talking to them is important because that means we would not want to use the adalimumab or infliximab. And that would be a stronger case for insurance to give us one of these other medications. So when you see a negative, it means it's not a great idea if somebody has that situation. A positive means it would probably be a good choice for that person because it's not going to make the cancer worse. Um, and the squiggle means we kind of don't know, so it's a little bit iffy. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, people with HS are about two to four times more likely to also have inflammatory bowel disease. And for some people, they know that ahead of time. They know they have inflammatory bowel disease and they know they have HS. So wouldn't it be great if we could use one medicine to treat both conditions? And yes, sometimes we are that lucky. And so TNF inhibitors are going to be one of those medications. So the adalimumab, the infliximab, galimumab, and some others. And then the interleukin in 12 and 23, this is used to kinumab. Uh, and if we can get it because of the inflammatory bowel disease, the dose is going to be higher. And remember, we want more medicine, especially for our patients with HS. Using the psoriasis dosing, which is the other reason that ustekinumab is FDA approved, it's going to be a lower dose. So the chance of it being successful is a little lower. Uh, we just don't have a lot of data or it's not a great idea. Some people who take interleukin 17s can have their inflammatory bowel disease made worse. Um, there's just not a lot of data on the interleukin ones or um, something like a premolast, which is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. Um, people with HS are also two to four times more likely to have inflammatory arthritis. And so again, there are some medicines that can be two for one here, TNF-alpha inhibitors, uh, something like a premolast or the interleukin 12 and 23 inhibitors. HS is happening to young women who might be thinking about getting pregnant. Um, and so which medications might be safe to use through pregnancy? Well, we know TNF inhibitors are safe and plus we have data knowing it's effective for HS. Whereas interleukin 17s, we don't have a ton of data in humans, but we have some limited data in animals showing that it's not causing any problem there. So this is a decent second option. And it's probably the next drug class to get FDA approval for HS. So I think these two things add uh, positives in its favor. Uh, interleukin ones, very limited data would be a little rush, uh, I think risky. Um, there is data coming and some studies being done for drugs that target interleukin-1. Uh, phosphodiesterase-4, there's actually some animal data showing that this would not be a good drug class for a pregnant woman. Uh, and it also is being um, studied in studies, being studied in studies. You can tell it's late. Um, and there are studies being done uh, for this um, drug class in HS. And then uh, interleukin 12 and 23, this is a decent backup option also to the TNF inhibitors. We do have some data here showing that it's probably not risky. We just don't have a ton of data in HS showing that it's a definite successful drug. So this is the data on ustekinumab. Again, a really nice option if somebody does have both HS and inflammatory bowel disease, it can also help uh, in arthritis. The use is mostly supported by some open label, meaning there's no comparison versus just naturally what kind of improvement we would get uh, just through the natural course of the disease. And was only studied in about 17 people. And so you can see about half of them, kind of similar to the adalimumab studies, had the same measure of success, which we call the high score. So um, it, sometimes a little bit harder to argue to insurance that we want this medicine just given the low number of people it's been studied in. So for some of you who um, do some dermatology, you might say, well, I didn't see anything about interleukin-23 inhibitors on the list. These are really effective medicines for people who have psoriasis. The problem is it might work in some people with HS, but when we used it in a broader number of people with HS, and this is a study of guselkumab, it's also been studied in another uh, interleukin-23 inhibitor called risenkizumab. And that data I'm, I don't have access to, but the company mentioned that it just didn't show success for that, so they're not pursuing it in the larger phase three studies. But this data is from the phase two studies, the earlier ones. Um, and they did not see a big enough difference for their medications, which are green and, and sort of the light blue here compared to the placebo. So it's a little bit risky to say, is this medicine actually doing anything when we give it to people beyond what the disease would just do anyway? 
And when we're looking at this information, one of the things to keep in mind, and this is what I study, is how do we measure success? Because right now we have this challenge in HS research when we're counting lesions or looking at the skin. There's sort of like taking a um, ruler and it's not made out of wood, it's made out of silly putty. And so that's the, you can tell how old I am now because I used silly putty as a kid, but you can kind of stretch it. And so if somebody really stretches that ruler, they'd say, wow, there's a lot of HS on this person. I'm counting a lot of different things. But somebody who doesn't count the same way, doesn't stretch the ruler in the same way is gonna get a very different number. And so we get a lot of variability in studies, maybe not because it's the HS changing, Maybe it's not because the drug making a big difference. It might be because of the way we're counting. And so one of the things where we don't see that issue of um, changes that are due to uh, not measuring correctly is when people answer questions. So when our patients answer questions about the impact of the HS on their lives, they are rock solid steady. You will not get a placebo rate based on chance or clinicians not uh, counting correctly. Um, and so when we looked at the impact of quality of life, um, we didn't see a huge difference. If we were gonna see a huge difference, we would see scores that are reaching down below this point of a big four point difference. In placebo, not a big difference here. In the active drug, again, two and a half to three and a half. So edging toward, but not really convincingly showing us that this drug is making a huge difference uh, in HS. Interleukin-1 inhibitors, we have two that we have access to right now. Again, there are some others in studies right now. Um, Ermecamab, I have to think about that for a second, uh, is the one that's being studied. Uh, Anakinra, not used so often because you have to inject it every day. Uh, Canakinumab, uh, also really hard to get because you have to really work through insurance or ask the company for it. Um, but it's a uh, dose more, I would say, friendly to um, life uh, because it's injected every four weeks instead of every 24 hours. But it does seem like interleukin-1 might be a good target uh, when we're treating HS. So a Premalast uh, medicine that's FDA approved right now for psoriasis. Uh, this is a study that came out of our colleagues in Europe. They studied it in a small number of patients, about 20, uh, with more moderate hydranidus superativa. And you can kind of see that in this picture. We don't see a lot of tunneling. We don't see that tunneling kind of coalescing or connecting across the body site. Uh, we can see some of these papules or nodules on the skin. So this is still a very impactful HS. And so I think of a premolast as an option if somebody's coming in with, you know, stage one HS. Um, I'm not seeing a ton of scarring, but I've done all the right things. I tried intermittent antibiotics. I tried maybe a medicine like spironolactone or finasteride or metformin or combinations of those. Um, and we're just not getting it under control. This might be a really nice option uh, for that person. All right, so I talked a lot about different drugs and I think I mentioned pretty frequently that most of these drugs are not FDA approved for HS. And so that means again, that insurance companies will really make us work in order to get these medicines for our patients. So how do we do that? We talked about which people might be good candidates, when to assess if somebody is having success, how to think about using these drugs and dosing them. But one of the other hows is how do we just get them for our patient? So one of them is to build the case in your note. So a lot of times insurance companies will want to know from the beginning, prove to me that this is moderate or severe HS. And again, you can do that based on that Hurley staging, but some of my patients who have a pretty significant impact from their HS, they don't always have early stage two, meaning tunneling or worse. Maybe sometimes they're moderate to severe because of the incredible impact on quality of life. I think the story I told you at the beginning where this woman is having trouble being the mother she wants to be. Maybe it's having poor pain control. So this is the pain numerical rating scale for pain uh, that goes from zero, no pain, up to 10 being the worst pain imaginable. We can argue based on the number of sites that people have. Quality of life, one of the scales that I often use in clinic is the 
Dermatology Life Quality Index. Uh, that was the DLQI that you may have seen um, back on that interleukin 23 slide. Again, a four point improvement shows a very significant improvement. And it's just, again, a quick 10 point survey that you can have people answer in the office. Sometimes building the case for one of these biologics is showing the insurance company that you really have tried and the patient has tried multiple prior therapies and they've been on it for multiple weeks to even multiple uh, months. And either the reason that it just didn't work or they had side effects and that's not you know, something that somebody can stay on if they had side effects. I try to document the weight so that way, again, insurance companies realize I'm asking for a higher dose because maybe it's needed for that person's weight. Now, when I write a prior authorization or PA letter, I write aggressively. Um, and so some of my friends talk about being salty and sweet. This is a time to be salty. Like we are talking about the incredible impact of this condition on patients' lives. It's the fact that they might have to be hospitalized. So we're, we're a little aggressive in the what ifs, could be hospitalized. It's having an impact on causing depression. It's, you know, actually the majority of our patients have depression or anxiety. Um, it's, you know, talking about how if we don't control inflammation on the skin, that skin and the cells can turn into cancer. And I think that's a really important point uh, for our patients as well, because so many of my patients want to know not only what can this medicine do for me, but what is the safety? Like, what are the side effects? And uh, very often, one of the first questions they have is, is it's going to cause cancer? And so I think we need to also keep in mind a couple of things. Not only are we thinking about what is the risk of this treatment? Yes or no. Is that acceptable? Yes or no. What we're really kind of saying is, is this drug and what it can do for me, the benefits and the risks, and what it might, again, help do for my HS and make me feel better, is that worth it versus the side effects and impact that the HS is having on me right now? Which one is maybe worse? Uh, so again, it's not so much a drug, yes or no, it's the HS I have now versus the HS and maybe added potential risk of that medication. Um, and if you can, sometimes it's nice, instead of just writing letter after letter, actually talk to another human being at the insurance company, because these are usually clinicians. They have actually taken care of patients before. So this is not a time to be aggressive. This is a time to be sweet, to speak honestly and earnestly so they can understand the impact of this condition uh, on the patient. So again, salty when you write, sweet when you speak. But also don't go it alone. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So the foundation recognizes that so many of you are out there fighting for these medications for your patients who are so impacted. And so if you go to our website, hsfoundation.org, and you go to resources, we have lots of different resources. We have resources for patients, for people doing research, as well as for clinicians. So if you hover over that, you'll see that we have some publications that you can download for free. So the North American Clinical Practice Guidelines, PDFs you can download, uh, other publications, including the rates of comorbidity and suggestions for screening for comorbidities for HS, because I listed a few of them for you um, earlier in that chart. Uh, there's a pamphlet you can download, which is really nice color, uh, trifold. You can, again, print it off, have it in your office. You don't have to pay for it. but the prior authorization templates. These are pure gold. And I want to thank Dr. Haley Nyack, who's also on our board, um, and some of her colleagues at UCSF for writing all of these. Uh, so you can download these as a Word document, modify them, add in all the pertinent information for your patient, and then send that over to the insurance company. And we have them for things that are on label and absolutely lots of things that are off label. But what's coming? So I think while we might be fighting the good fight right now, um, especially with insurance companies trying to get these medications for our patients, um, there are a ton of trials, lots of research happening on HS. And the more we learn about why HS is happening in the skin, it gives us more targets to create medications. So I talked about some of the interleukin-1 and interleukin-17 medications that have already been approved for other conditions sometimes and are now being um, sort of 
repurposed for HS because we think these cytokines are pretty important, um, but also something called JAK inhibitors, um, but also other targets. Uh, so B cells, um, part of the immune system that maybe we don't usually think of as a very active in uh, conditions like psoriasis or eczema, but maybe play a pretty important role for um, HS. And all these medications probably are gonna be coming uh, to the market in about 2023 to 2025. So in the next probably six to 12 months, we will have another FDA approved drug. Fingers crossed, knock on wood. So are these drugs, how are they going to perform compared to the ones we already have? So the interleukin-17 inhibitors, based on the earlier phase two studies, probably very similar to maybe slightly higher rates of success. Um, so the adalimumab rates of success were about uh, 42 to 59%. So this is right in that neighborhood. Um, Bermecumab, again, an interleukin-1 inhibitor, maybe a little bit higher. JAK inhibitors, really big range here, but some pretty impressive numbers from some of the early studies. Um, so really a lot to look forward to when it comes to getting control uh, over HS. So take home points, and I would really love your questions. I hope you put some in the chat or in the Q&A box. So which patients? Well, I think of a few things. It's not just what I see on the skin, because sometimes people come in with a good day. Uh, it's not just Hurley stage two or Hurley stage three. It's, is this somebody who's got Hurley one, maybe inching toward Hurley two? but they have scarring and that scarring and that damage is impactful. Um, and is it also just the impact of this condition on them if they have the, what, clinically more mild to moderate HS, the impact on their quality of life trumps that. Because again, I know that there's error in how we count. I'm gonna go with what the patient is reporting to me, the person with that condition. Which drug? You know what, being a pragmatist, I wanna get this condition under control sooner rather than later. And so if I have to fight for three months to get a drug, that person is not under control. So I tend to go with the things that at least with insurance, I can get fast and early knowing that we can give it a period of time, three, four months, six is the longest for me, um, and then transition over to another medication later. And if we do have to transition because people are still getting those migratory bumps, going to be again four to six months. And as soon as I get that new drug, we're, we're getting it started. The overlap in the system is low risk. And if somebody's not clear, but it's because there are some persistent pockets, again, that's not failure of the medicine, at least not for right now. Eventually, we'll have medicines that probably can decrease some of that inflammation in tunnels. Right now, that's the drug took care of some of the migratory bumps. Let's go back and do some in-office procedures to get rid of some of those more persistent pockets of inflammation. And since we do very often have to fight for these medications, document as much of the quality of life impact of the pain scores, document early stages, and maybe even the number of abscesses and nodules, because it'll help you get the medicine in the first place, but also documenting improvement, a reduction in pain score, a decrease in the number of abscesses is gonna be really important to getting renewals and continued uh, coverage of that medication. And when you have to fight for that, again, use shock and awe, salty and sweet, be aggressive when you're right, but when you do that peer to peer, um, speak earnestly. Um, but also as in kicking off HS Awareness Week, know that there are so many good things coming and I am so excited about some of the responses that I'm seeing when we're doing this research in clinic. So thank you for taking some time out of your busy Monday and joining us for this talk. Coming up later this week, we're gonna have a couple of other talks coming up on what is HS, the pathogenesis. This is a talk geared more for people who have this condition or want to learn more about it. Also another talk for people affected by HS is gonna be on pain and pain management. Um, so if you can join us on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're gonna have three more talks. Great, thank you, Dr. Kirby, for an excellent talk. And uh, we are gonna go rapid fire. We have 11 minutes left. And so the first question is, you kind of answered it, but how long do you stay on these medications? When do you, when is enough is enough? And then secondly, if you could time that, what about the surgery with these medications? So Ilt, I'm gonna, of course, ask for your help with some of these questions since you taught me how to do procedures on HS. Now. We also have some new research. Uh, it's something called the SHARP study, uh, which was done where people were given either adalimumab 
or placebo, um, so no treatment, and then they had a procedure to see if the medication was increasing the risk of complications uh, or contributed to poor healing. The answer is it doesn't. Um, and so I keep people on the biologics um, leading up to surgery and even afterwards. Um, now, my colleagues who are plastic surgeons will sometimes want to stop the medication. I try to convince them that it's safe to continue the biologic, but ultimately when they are doing their bigger case, the patient is under their care. I'm kind of curious how you approach it. Same way. Um, I don't stop anything anymore. And especially after the Sharp study, um, and I, I, even before I didn't do that because I didn't feel as infectious. So I agree. Keep going with the biologic. And then to your point that you made, it's four to six months. I stop at three months just because a third of patients will respond at three months after that. There's not that much of an improvement. Um, but I think four to six months is a reasonable time frame. So that took on that question. Um, and then- So can I just build on that for one second though? Because yeah. I agree with you. I, I want people to respond, you know, in three weeks, um, three months. I, I agree with you. 12 weeks is a reasonable period of time. Part of the reason why I push it a little longer because you're right, it's only a third of people who didn't respond that will is because of just the incredible delays and hassles in trying to get the next drug. So if I can eke out just a little bit of chance that they're gonna respond, then that means we've saved everybody a little bit of hassle. Well, patients always admire your efforts there. And uh, um, um, I also wanna kind of give a shout out to Maria Lishan from Stanford University who did a lot of the work on those um, prior authorizations. Um, Next question is, how do you manage some of the severe side effects? Can you kind of give people a gestalt of how often do we see side effects with these medications and what are the big ones to worry about? And then if they do have a side effect, how do they manage that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I distinctly remember starting off prescribing these medications and so often getting the question, not of how well is this medicine gonna work, from the people who have HS, but what are the side effects of this medicine? Um, very concerned about what this medication might be doing to their body. Um, and I, I wanna just answer that in two ways. One is I think reminding people that it's, their immune system is not broken or defective or deficient. And again, any one of us who had been getting these bumps that look for all the world like an infection, over and over for years and years and getting antibiotic after antibiotic, I, I can kind of see how you would conclude that you are um, immune deficient. Um, and so taking one of these medications, like I would look like a crazy person to somebody if I did not help them understand that your immune system is actually attacking things it doesn't need to attack. It's creating something that looks like infection when it doesn't have to. And that's why we're gonna try and use these medicines to bring your immune system back down towards like a typical level of activity. We're not gonna take your immune system that's low and make it worse. You're, you're kind of super when it comes to your immune system. And I think that's the same for healing. People see these wounds on their skin and they think, oh, I don't heal well. Well, you don't heal well because that's active inflammation under there. Once we get that all out, you're a champ at healing. And I, I think that sometimes doing these procedures really shows people just how amazing uh, their skin can be when we just get rid of the HS inflammation. Um, but going back to your point, which I got off on a tangent a little bit, safety is um, the most common side effect is gonna be an injection site reaction. So it looks like a welt, um, and I think just reassuring people, anticipating they're gonna see this welt and think that they're allergic to the medicine. They're not, it happens in about one out of 10 people. It's kind of itchy and it goes down after about 24 hours. Um, other kind of side effects, most of the time it's gonna be like one or two more colds during the year, but the risk of serious infection, which was studied in the really big phase three studies, not really significantly higher, not impressively. It was pretty balanced uh, when we looked at the number of people. Uh, risk of cancer, also not really much higher. And again, that risk of cancer, um, when our immune systems are constantly active for years and years and years, there's actually some research also from Amit Garg, who's on our board, showing that people who uh, have HS, just like people who have psoriasis and eczema, their immune systems can go haywire and turn into cancer if it's not controlled. So it's not just that the medications might increase risk, it's that uncontrolled disease can have a risk. That's well stated. And I think that's a warning to all of us to say, 
inflammation that's not managed is a risk unto itself. Right. These medications do have side effects. Some of them can be serious, but we can quantify how often those side effects can happen. We don't really know what long-term HS does to people's immune system. And I like the way you phrased it. I always tell my patients that you effectively have an allergy, we think to your normal bacteria. And you can't live without these normal elements of your body, your normal bacteria, your skin cells and other elements that are making you up. So then we have to kind of rebalance you. And I think that, that appropriate framing is helpful. The thing is we have very good lymphoma data on these medications now. But I also want to emphasize that your foundation, HS Foundation, is also funding research in all the things that patients are concerned about, such as diet. We are looking at diet. We are looking at surgery. We are looking at alternative medicine as well. And we don't want to only push medications, but medicines are rigorously studied in a way that many other elements are not. Um, and then uh, um, uh, the next question was, uh, would you recommend Evoshield prophylaxis for COVID for those on biologics? And maybe you can talk about the COVID registry too. Yeah, so great point. Um, our colleague Haley Nyack at UCSF uh, started the COVID registry. So um, if somebody does have COVID, whether they're on a biologic or not, if they have HS, uh, they can enter their information as the person or as a provider, you can register somebody. Um, now during the I would say length of the pandemic, we have learned that actually people with HS don't seem to have a higher risk of danger from COVID. And also when they're on these medications also do not have a higher risk of say hospitalization or death. That's either due to their HS or being on a biologic and having their HS. So the short answer is no, I don't prophylax um, just because they're on these medications or because they have HS. So far, those two factors don't seem to indicate that people are as immunocompromised as some of the other folks who would have an indication for the Evashield. And I think uh, it's also nice to remember that your HS Foundation um, served all of you by convening during the peak phase of COVID. Um, and we actually started organizing a lot of this data. And then we put out guidelines um, that have been used for a couple of years. And Haley Nike and, and the rest of you, Richards, are a lot of credit in organizing this data. And also there's data, as you suggested, that the biologics do not increase the risk of COVID complications. Um, so you have that data, we have measurements. Does it apply to each one of you? It doesn't, it's just guidelines. And all of us look at you as individuals. Um, but this is these are some guidelines to say, well, you don't really need to have a shield across the entire population, but each person's situation is a little different. If you have other comorbidities, you're on multiple immunosuppressives, um, you work in a field that's really high risk, maybe but for the most part, not recommended. Um, great. Well, I want to thank you, Jocelyn, for this incredible presentation. I want to thank you for your leadership, your compassion. I want to thank your husband and your two kids for allowing you to come in from eight to nine to share all this wonderful knowledge with our patients, with our colleagues, with our society. Um, and the last picture that you showed, I think, is apropos. Uh, there is so much on the horizon, and all of us coming together is resulting in something very, very special. And that special material will give our patients more hope, more support, and also for all their loved ones who take such good care of them. So thank you so much. And, and I also wanted to thank Brent, our executive director um, from North Carolina, who also plays bass and uh, Lauren um, from our organizational support that's helped organize this platform as well as organizing SHSA, which will be in October. I welcome you to that meeting. And then I'm gonna finish you off, uh, Jocelyn. Do you wanna just give everybody a quick update on the patient and the, med and the resident and the uh, nurse practitioner uh, PA events coming up? Absolutely. Thanks, Ilt. Uh, it's like you did this for a living. Um, so if you go to our website, hs, then hyphen foundation.org, and you go to the events tab at the top, you'll see a drop down. It'll take you to a new page. It'll show you all of the events that we have coming up because a big part of what we believe in about HS is not only creating the research and the results, but getting the word out there. So teaching it to other people. So we have a meeting coming up, which is our big research intense meeting called the SHSA. You'll mention that it's coming up in October. 
beginning of October. We also have two other meetings that are designed to help bring clinicians up to warp speed on HS. So that's the HS Academy for residents in dermatology, but also HS In-Depth, which is designed for physician assistants and nurse practitioners. And then our fourth meeting is the HS Summit. And so this is the HS Foundation sharing